yeah, so exciting to have such a great group um, tonight. So my name's Rachel, and I think it's been mentioned by you know a number of the, the two speakers we had and the beautiful performance, you know, to sort of see how important story is as a tool, right? For us to be able to see what another human being's experience is and understand it better. Um, and so, so I, I'm a documentary um, producer, director, um, and f you know, fell in love with story. Um, met my collaborator actually traveling the country with a project called StoryCorps about 10 years ago um, as a radio producer, yeah. Um, and we were traveling around the country and realizing just you know, what an issue um, home is. And coming back to New York, it was kind of the heart, the, the top of the foreclosure crisis here, hitting the long-term affordability crisis in New York. And so started doing storytelling around, around that with a project called Housing as a Human Right. And I wanted to start there because I think, you know, fundamentally at the issue of climate change is a, is a crisis of home, right? Um, and increasingly we've been doing more work around environmental issues because, um, because you know, these in, climate change is encroaching on our homes, right? Um, but, but I started here thinking about um, displacement, trying to connect stories of homelessness with people in foreclosure, with renter issues. How do, we, how do people talk to each other? It was so beautiful, even just one of the um, folks talking about their experience as a refugee, you know, it totally connects to people that are dealing with housing issues, right? It becomes a visceral thing in the body. I still remember a woman that I interviewed who was going through foreclosure just talking about how she was going through all these heart palpitations, she didn't know what was going on. She talked to a nurse, and you know, the nurse kind of just took her on a walk around the ward, right, where she would go to get help and healthcare. And she was like, oh wow, my blood pressure's going down. But, and the nurse was like, well yeah, you're talking to me. You know, you're talking it out, right? Like these issues become so ingrained in the body. And, and it's like across all issues, people that are dealing with displacement, they're dealing with the crisis of home. So, um, so we have been telling stories around home for about 10 years and um, different stories of people trying to maintain or obtain their home. Um, we also visited South Africa and we're interested in talking to folks there who have been working to protect the human right to housing um, in South Africa but are also dealing with displacement. I mean, this was actually around the World, um, the World Cup in 2010. Right, so it's not you know just climate change they're dealing with these mass events that we create also create displacement, um, and so when Hurricane Sandy hit um, and, fl and we were flooded here, we kind of knew that this was going to be a long term issue that was going to affect housing. We had actually partnered with folks after in, after Katrina in New Orleans, and followed the big loss of public housing there, and so we're worried about the threat to, to housing here in New York. And so pretty quickly after the storm, decided to, to, I kind of went out with my microphone to Red Hook, and my collaborator Michael helped start Occupy Sandy, which was a group um, that was like a grassroots movement. Um, just, just sort of Occupy Sandy. Um, you know, and this was what a lot of people had on their doorstep. How many people were here in, after Sandy, or during Sandy? Yeah, right, okay. So I mean, I think, I, I can't speak for you all, but for me personally, I grew up on the, you know, spending a lot of time on the Jersey Shore, but for me it was like a real moment of, you know, this is no longer an abstract issue, right? This is like at our doorstep. And, and having heard all the stories after Katrina, just knew that this was going to be like a long-term thing, right? And so this is Hoboken. This is one of the cell phone images that came into our project. So we started a project called Sandy Storyline right after the storm. And the goal was really to create a space for people to tell stories, knowing that um, often in these big, large-scale things like the housing crisis, the immigration crisis, refugee crisis, people's voices are silenced. And so how do we use some of the tools that we have in our hands to invite people to, sh to share what's happening with them? So that week, you know, I went to Red Hook, and it was in the charging station, and you know, people were telling stories, and they were showing me photos they had on their cell phone already in the, in the day or two after the storm. And so we created a space for people to submit text, mes text message stories, they could call a storyline, and then they could submit stories, which they've been doing now for, it's almost nearly five years since the storm. So people, if you go on the site, you can read people's written testimony or photographs, audio stories. Um, and you know, it's a window into just like all the different challenges that people are experiencing after the storm, the short-term displacement, you know, we had many different communities 
that were immediately had to leave their homes for months, sometimes years, trying to get back. Um, we actually followed one community that was a, an adult home that had been displaced, and they, you know, they were shuffled to a hotel, and then we actually, we were helping to tell their story when they were actually placed in a mental institution out in Queens, because that was the only place that could house this large group of people, right? And it was really traumatic for a lot of folks to kind of be far away from home in a place that was strange, that was hospital-like, where they felt like they were institutionalized. And a lot of these stories weren't necessarily being heard, so we created this storytelling platform. I think like many people that are working on these different issues to try to create a space for people to t share those stories. So I just wanted to play quickly, a, just like the minute trailer. From the you one story uh, just because I only have a little bit of time um, that we're actually working on right now so so since we started the project right after the storm um, we've been following different communities this is one that's in upstate New York um, and not many people know you know know the situation right it's kind of dropped out of the headlines what's happening to people after Sandy um, but this community actually um, I was recently at a meeting that had a little bit more people even like about 150 families that um, are dealing with what to do with their homes, right, even five years later. So this community in particular, it's a mobile home community, and it's, on up, it's upstate, it's right on the Hudson River, and many folks don't necessarily know that, you know, people on the river were also impacted, but um, they're, they're sort of nestled in right there. It's beautiful, as you can see, where they are. But, um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a mix, it's sort of a mix of white family, white working class families and Latino families, that have affordable homes, right? Mobile home structures. Um, and a lot of them were impacted by the storm. Some people had to leave, they weren't able to repair, but a lot of people held on. Um, but they got a blow in about 2015. They were told that they are now in a 100-year floodplain. So they have, everybody has to leave, right? Um, the state has put together a kind of program for folks to, to move, but um, but it, because they're poor and it's an affordable community, they, the, the state hasn't been willing to buy them out. Um, so, so they've been fighting for different solutions that could actually be sustainable for them. Because you know, when you're living somewhere, some of them have lived there for 20 years, they have a church, they have their kids' schools, they have jobs, they don't wanna leave. So, um, so it's been a real issue for years for people where even if they were able to rebuild, now they have the, the situation where they're not sure if they're gonna have to go permanently. So, um, so they've been fighting with the state to try to get better solutions. Um, initially, they were just offered that you could buy a mobile home somewhere close by, but, um, but unfortunately, there's no mobile home parks nearby. So, um, so then they were able to get more renter solutions and homeowner solutions that were, they were offered just this year. Um, but it's, it's been an incredible struggle to, to watch, both because of the amazing organizing that the community has done, um, but also just to, to see what the community is facing, right? To see 150 homeowners that five years later are still dealing with the issue of whether or not they're gonna have to move and totally uproot their family now. So, I mean, I guess I would share that story to say that it's, I mean, this is what a lot of communities across the East Coast, across the, the United States are gonna be facing, right? And as we think about the long-term crisis, it's not somewhere else, but it's actually here. Um, and, and a lot of the stories are hidden, and so we're trying to surface what's happening so people can really make informed decisions around both um, our policies around fossil fuel extraction, but also how we're planning, how we're planning better, how we're making communities more resilient to these kind of storms that we know are gonna happen. So I wanted to share something hopeful. <laughs> I know a lot of us have been sharing um, sad things, right, about how our world is going to hell. 
But um, so I want to share one last project that we've started that we chose partly because we were a little depressed after <laughs> telling all these stories. Um, and we were really inspired by it. And so we called it Water Warriors. And it's about a community in New Brunswick, Canada that was able to successfully fight against fracking and the fossil fuel infrastructure. So, um, so this community was inundated, I guess in 2013, by a Texas-based energy company called SWN. And they came with trucks that they wanted to explore um, for fracking. These big thumper trucks kind of came, came through these regional highways and were doing ultrasounds of the ground to figure out where the gas is. Um, and it was doing it in big chunks of New Brunswick, which is kind of like a state province there. Um, and it's a rural community. It depends a lot on fishing um, and, and has a really strong indigenous community called Elsa Puktuk. Um, and so we, this was actually just even part of the exploratory process. People don't think that sometimes their water could even be threatened by that process. But community members were starting to see from some of the drilling they were doing just in the exploratory process that their aquifers were being contaminated. So this was one of the, one of the um, areas that we documented. I want to just play the trailer to give you a sense of this story. Water is the gift of life. Nothing in this world can live without water. This is disrupting the natural flow of the aquifers underground, for one. There's no doubt about that. I couldn't know what I knew and not act. Every day people were waking up and they were like, how am I going to fight today? We are all warriors, and we are here to protect. They're not going to stop, and neither are we. We have to fight for this earth because there isn't another one. This is the only planet that we have. So we're excited to share the story. We actually just premiered it at the Tribeca Film Festival, and we're going to be sharing it um, with communities across the United States. So if you have communities that you know of that would benefit, it's a 22-minute film, and we also have an exhibit. Um, but part of why we're so excited is because they were successful, right? They got the company to leave, and then they were able to actually get a moratorium put in place that has now been made indefinite in 2016. Super exciting. And this is a group of regular people. Maybe you got a sense from the trailer, but just like you know, moms, people that work, lobster fishermen, people that just felt like this is important to me and I'm gonna stand up. Um, they didn't actually have a lot of NGO support in the province that they had. They didn't have support around the, the election process, but they were actually able to be successful. And so I, we hope it's an inspirational story. I think, I think I'm excited about the possibility, even more so after um, the new administration, about the possibility of regular people standing up and and actually making a difference. So thank you all for being here. And yeah.